Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Metal Command Podcast. Tony here with you. And today I am bringing you an interview with Ronnie Atkins, who is best known as the vocalist for the band Pretty Maids, as well as singing in Avantasia. And also he has recorded three very excellent solo albums over the last two, three years. And to be honest with you, Ronnie is one of my top 10 vocalists of all time. So we touch on a little bit of everything. We talk about his career with the Pretty Maids. We talk about him singing in Avantasia. And of course, we talk about his three solo albums, more specifically the newest album called Trinity, which just came out not long ago. So with that said, here's the interview with myself and Ronnie Atkins. Uh, Ronnie, it's great to have you on my show. You have a uh, brand new solo album trinity and uh talk about this record you have three really good solo albums i think that you've put out and um let's talk about the newest one you've put out sure um yeah i mean first of all i I really didn't intend to put out a new album uh this year because uh Mm -hmm. you know i've I've had two or two albums already under my belt but uh but uh, you know the songs just came and uh so you know basically half of it was like i had some leftover ideas from the last album and from the past and uh Mm -hmm. and actually it turned into a whole album so we did sort of did half of it last the fall of 2022 you know up until uh, christmas and then the rest of it this spring you know yeah so um so it was just like randomly what i had of ideas it wasn't like that i sat down and say now we're going to go for a more uh rock album or more harder album or, or, but as it happened i mean some of the songs were written on you know um distorted guitar and turned out like songs like godless and uh ode to a madman so they it turned out to be a little bit more metal than it than the first two albums maybe were, sure. you know? yeah. yeah yeah the solo albums to me come off a little more um AOR oriented as opposed to stuff that like the pretty maids, you know, normally would do. And yeah. what made you decide, Hey, I want to put out these solo records. And what made you decide to uh, do these three albums to begin with? Well, just, you know, first of all, uh, when we ended and when I was hit by cancer in 2019, right. Mm-hmm. You know, this was like, the, it was some sort of a way out, you know, but it, it was a kind of a coincidence actually, because I mean, it was like, it was a long period. I couldn't sing. And then, um, then at some point, Chris Laney, the keyboard player, pretty much the producer of these albums, you know, he said to me, and I said, I got all these ideas. I was, I was in pit. I was in shock. I was in grief because my, my cancer spread after I was actually was cleared, you know, to my bones. Mm-hmm. That said, I'm, I'm fine right now. Um, but, um, so, uh, I couldn't really, I couldn't hit the high notes every time I was hitting the high notes. I, I started coughing and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now well, we're talking the spring of 2020. Then he sent me, he did this project called At the Movies, you know, where they did, did new versions of old mm. movies in the 80s. Yeah. yeah. And he asked me if I wanted to be on it. And I said, What song you wanted to sing? And he said, What about this? And we don't need another hero, you know, by Tina Turner from Mad Max. Um, and I said, Yeah, yeah, let, uh, let, let me give it a try. If we can do it, I'll do it. Otherwise, you've got to find somebody else to do it. But I did it, and I did it like in two takes. And, and I knew, and I just felt that, like, okay, man, wow, I got my pipes back, you know. And from there on, we just said, I said, Well, okay, I'll send you some of my ideas and stuff like that. And I sent the, wrote the song, actually, mined them and I played them in on my iPhone, and I started sending it to him. And as the situation was in 2020, you know, we actually did the way he did, we, we agreed on the arrangement. And he did a demo because he plays a little bit of everything, uh, which I'm not good at. And I did the vocals. And so we knew that we at least had the vocals and we could do the rest of the instrumentation, instrumentation later. On, you know? sure. And that, that formula we basically just kept up until now. And, and we did the same thing on Make It Count and the new one, Trinity. So, uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, so I, had, I just got, so the, the, the songs just came together. It's like when you focus on, on something and you say that, um, Okay, now we well, let's, let's do an album. And so, what's the deadline? Then, then it it kind of just you know goes faster, you know. So, but but in principle, about this album compared to the other ones, I don't think there's a big difference in the way I write. Uh, I'm, and I also write in that way pretty much. But the most important thing for me is a good good uh, hook line, a good uh, top line, mm-hmm. uh, or a good or a good riff. You know, a good melodic stuff, a good verse, good bridge, good chorus. You know that that's. Uh, and if I write it on an acoustic guitar or write it on a piano, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but but when you got the good, when you got the sole foundation of a song, and you think you have a good something going here, you know, you, sure. you know. It's going to be, it can be good depending on, then you decide what, what kind of direction do we want to 
produce this in, you know. And from day one, when I did the first album, One Shot, I decided to to go for, you know, that something that was suitable for the people that's been supporting me and Pretty Mates for the last 30, 40 years. Mm-hmm. Um, everything else would have been stupid. I mean, I'm 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 an old fart, man. I'm 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 an old traditional songwriter, you know, old school songwriter. And uh, I'm writing out of from what I was in, influenced by in the '70s and '80s, you know. And, and I didn't want to change that thing, you know, because uh, if there's going to be a new revolt in the music industry, it's not going to come from an almost 60 year old guy, you know. Yeah, youngster. So I just did what I always kind of did, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and what you do quite what you've done quite well for for a very long time, you know. It always blows my mind um, when I think of the Pretty Maids because I I followed this band probably for 25, 26 years, and it it's always blown my mind that y- your band here in America really has not really with the kind of songs you write. I'm shocked that you guys never really had a huge audience over here like maybe you might have in Europe and it, it blows my mind because I remember the first album that I had heard by you guys might have been the Spooked album it was right around the time when that came out and then I started listening and going mm. back and listening to a lot of the stuff that you'd put out and it, it always blew my mind that a, that a band like yours like the Pretty Mates for example never got bigger here Mm. Yeah, I mean, the, um, yeah, you could say so. I mean, we, we, we had we had the possibilities in the 80s, you know, because mm-hmm. I mean, we actually were in contact with uh, different managements in America that wanted us, but they wanted us to move to America and uh, they wanted us to uh, sign something that we, we were not supposed to get married, shit like that, you know. Mm-hmm. But essentially, uh, the, the big breakthrough we could have had actually in 87, you know, but as it happened, we already committed ourselves to a big tour in Europe with Deep Purple, uh, mm-hmm. the Blue Lights tour, and that was when our album Fusion was out. And then, um, then we had an offer to go out with White Snake for three weeks uh, on their, and they were huge in America at the time in '87. Yeah. And I'm just, but we couldn't because we we're already committed to Deep Purple over here. So, but, you know, it's just some. I'm just well, sometimes I'm wondering if we'd said yes to do that, we'd probably have had our uh, quite a breakthrough in America, you know, because both uh, Future World and Love Games we played a lot of MTV back then, and uh, and we probably would have done some gigs on our own or jumped onto another tour or something like that, as it mm-hmm. was back then, you know. Yeah. But it is what it is. And then we took another three years because of different uh, circumstances to to put out the next album, which was called Lethal Heroes in America. Yeah. Jump in the rest of the world. And when that came out, came out, you know, the scene just has totally changed. You know, it was like. Uh, um, sleaze metal it was Guns N' Roses and all those bands coming out of LA and that was the the, the top spot of the day you know so we yeah. were like long haired kind of we were not really hair metal even though we dressed like we were but we never really been, been a hair metal band you know we just looked like our um, you know uh, American colleague, colleagues inspired by what bands were wearing back then and stuff like that but musically I think we were pretty far from hair metal to be honest I don't know but anyway that was and so 92 we did an album called syndicate and that became really really successful over here and in Japan we had a big hit with a song called please don't leave me but at that time mm-hmm. that you know the grunge were were now the big thing you know so and we never made it to America at all we recorded two albums in, in America in America and sure. we shot some videos videos over there but never never did a real tour in fact the very first time we played a concert on American soil was I think it was in 2012 at the Proc Power Festival in Atlanta you know and um, we're talking 30 years on right yeah so so yeah that that's why I guess you know because I think the music what we did or what we've done all, all those years would kind of fit American uh, people as well you know American radio back then in the 80s where I felt that yeah, a- absolutely, absolutely. I-, I would agree with you. And it's interesting you brought up Deep Purple because you know you did that you know tour obviously with them, and it, you had some kind of relationship with them because obviously you had a member of Deep Purple producing Jump the Gun. You know, Ian yeah. Gillen did a Christmas song with you. You know, so um, yeah, I thought that was pretty. I-, I thought that was really cool. But Jump the Gun, I think, is a very good record, and I, I never equated you. I, I never really thought of you as a, like a hair metal band. I mean, a lot of bands dressed sort of like that because that was the thing back then, but uh, the music definitely didn't do that. But you did work with member of Deep Purple on Jump the Gun. 
We did. I mean, Roger Glover produced the album. In fact, I just met him in, in, in Argentina last spring, you know, and, and in Germany this spring. I haven't seen him for years. He was a fucking great, one of the true real gentlemen in rock and roll, you know. So, yeah, we, so we had this connection that actually Ian Pace played a place on the album as well on two tracks because of mm-hmm. drama and car accident. And we toured with the Purple Guys. Um, we toured, we did a, some gigs with Rainbow in the 80s as well. Um, so we had this connection and Bruce Payne, their manager, was, was our co-manager for a while as well, you know. But but as I said, then the, the music changed. I mean, when the grunge came and everything, you know, so everything just kind of, yeah, got off the rails, I guess, somehow, you know. And, and it was, it was suddenly, it was tough times for traditional hard rock bands up to the 90s, you know. But we managed to survive basically due to that single hit we had, you know, that gave us the sure. capability to, to play bigger festivals in, in Scandinavia and and we always maintained the market in Germany, you know. So, yeah, it is what it is. Now, now, as far as the Pretty Maids go, you are touring with them. You know, there's some sh- there's some uh, dates booked for you. Do you have any plans to, at some point in the next year or maybe year or two, record another record? No, no we just we just uh, announced a couple of festivals, you know. Because I mean, mm-hmm. uh, another thing that happened in 2019, I think, uh, you know, this chemistry wasn't there. In fact, the band hasn't met since 2019 right now. But we go and we talk to everybody, and sure. everybody is ready to give it another go. But there was a bad chemistry, in particular between me and me and Kenny. We had some issues and stuff like that. But uh, we talked about things, and we also have a, a you know a 40 year history together, you know. So we can always have a one hell of a laugh when we're together, you know. So we just. Uh, Decided, you know, to leave those things aside, you know, and and, and meet up with a positive attitude. And that's what we're going to do. Mm-hmm. And then uh, let's see how things turn out, you know. Let's see if the chemistry is there, if the fire is there. And if if it is, you know, I, I, I don't know. We might record something. I don't know. We But we haven't decided that. And I haven't committed myself to do that. I mean, we got so many albums these uh, under our belt, you know. And, and we actually have a new album out. It's not new anymore. But it came out in 2019. Yeah. And for many reasons, we never had people. Partly because of my illness and and partly because of the corona, we yeah. never had a chance to go out and and do give it a proper tour, you know, and, and tour with that album, you know. So we actually have an album worth of material that we never played live. So there's enough to do, and that it's I mean, doing more albums just got to make it hit more and more difficult to make those set lists, you know. I mean, the more songs you have to choose from, you know, the harder it is. But let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I'm looking forward to do these uh, do, do these gigs. Let's see how much it's going to be. You know, it might be more than those three gigs. Probably will but yeah yeah it's it's crazy when you have a huge discography it's got to be like a debate like who what do i pl- what songs do we play i mean you always have those set group of songs that you know people are always going to want to hear but then it's like okay you have to fill the rest of the set and how do you pick that it, it's got to be you know when you have a long discography it doesn't matter who, what band you are right it could be it could be you guys it could be like iron maiden or somebody like that who has like you know, 15, 20 albums, you know, I mean, that's got to be difficult to do sometimes. Well, it is, it is. I mean, but basically I think um, we we had a long period from 95 up until, actually up until we did Pandemonium in 2010, where we didn't really, we did some albums, but yeah, as I said, it was hard, hard times in, in rock and roll at the time, and particularly in hard rock and heavy metal. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the diehard fans know these albums, but a lot of other people don't know these albums. So we basically play some of the real old stuff from the first, from, you know, from the Red Hot and Heavy Future World Jump the Gun album. Yeah. And then we play stuff from the last 10, 12 years, you know, where we've been really consistent in, in, in re- releasing new music. And it was just like we found a new with Pandemonium. From 2010, it was like we got a got a, a, a brand new kind of a new audience uh, coming coming to see us on Motherland 2012 and then yeah. King Man, the last album. So uh, it's uh, it's probably gonna you know the set is gonna be mainly for those two periods, I guess you know, and maybe we'll we'll you know try to find a, a rabbit from some of your from these albums in between, as we said, the forgotten years, kind of you know. Let's see. Yeah, it's it's always interesting uh, when you when you when I'm looking at the errors of this band, and you're, and you're right. Um, you, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where you know some of those albums in the early 2000s were s- sort of forgotten, and even even some of the albums that came out. You know, I, I like. You know, I don't think you've ever put out a, a bad record. The only album I really was never a huge fan of was you know Wake Up to the Real World. It wasn't like it was terrible, but it was kind of like that's my least favorite album you guys have ever put out uh but it's like pandemonium i f- always felt like you hit some sort of stride or some sort of turning point 
and every album since then has been pretty much flawless. The band got a little heavier, uh, but the songwriting to me this took a huge step up. You know, when that album came out, it's been like that ever since. I totally agree with you because I mean, uh, Wake Up to the Real World was done in a period of time where we were not real. I mean, we made a deal with Frontiers Records and they wanted an album. And we got together, you know, but it was some kind of a, you know, a half-hearted attempt, I think, you know, I mean, listening back to it now, I think it's it's nothing uh, compared mm -hmm. to the, the albums that came after it. So uh, we did it, and I think we, we we did our best at the time being, but it was just like the, the, the spirit and the fire wasn't really there. There's some okay things on that album, but, mm -hmm. but when we did the Pandemonium album, it was the first time we hooked up with uh, Jacob Hansen, our new producer, actually, it was Michael Paulson from Bobby, who actually recommended him. And, and I've done everything with him ever since, you know, basically. It was a, it was it was just a match made in heaven. You know, we started to detune the guitars so it sounded a little bit more update updated. And um but we've just wrote better songs, you know, better, better hooks and better riffs and stuff like that. So yeah. uh, really we really had a um some kind of a rebirth. I mean the band was never never broke up or anything. We really had a, a musical uh, rebirth with uh, Pandemonium and the albums yeah. that came. Did did Jacob have a lot to do with uh, the rebirth, or it was just it was just you guys and the, the types of songs you were you were trying to write at the time? Yeah, he had something to do with because he came with his input. I mean, he didn't write the songs, but he just he, he's more the kind of guy that said, "Yeah, I like this. Uh, or oh, this could maybe be better." He's got his own way. He's very very diplomatic, you know. So uh, mm -hmm. he's a very easy going guy to work with, and uh, so he definitely had some impact on it and and the way we should go sound wise. He's got a good set of ears. And he's great mixer but he's also cool working with you know so in particularly on pandemonium and mobile and we my number all of the albums we've done with him you know we 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 trust in him and he trusted you know we we know where we can push ourselves he knows how far he can push us and and what we can what we're capable and and we know what he's capable of doing you know so it's it's just a great um relationship working relationship absolutely yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting to go. And I w it was funny you mentioned about these albums from the 2000s because, I mean, you had some really, really good records, uh, in my opinion. But I think, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of those albums ended up going under the radar. And uh, I, I think the last album, Address Your Madness, I think that's one of the better albums you guys had actually, you know, put out. And, you know, it's interesting when you did the album uh, Louder Than Ever, for example, you did some you know, newer versions of some of the songs uh, from that era and even maybe a little bit earlier, you know, some of the albums that people probably didn't pay as much attention to mm -hmm. and brought yeah. new life to them, in my opinion. Most of the time, I'm not a fan of when bands do that, but I think you guys did a very good job at, at uh, bringing those songs back to life and even maybe, in a sense, making them sound a little bit different than the original ones. And that's basically what we wanted to update the sound a little bit, you know, but it's also difficult to pick all the songs. I mean, what songs are we going to do, you know, and what yeah. I realized doing that project, because you know, the whole idea was to have some, that was to have that album, some, some sort of intermission in between two new studio albums, right? Mm -hmm. And um, But I think it turned out pretty good, you know, pretty, oh, that was all right. I think it's all, there's, some, um, there's some good new songs on the album, you know, and, uh, uh, but I just realized that you shouldn't really start you know, you know, fucking around with with old songs like that, you know, because uh, it's just it's just difficult, you know, because in, in particularly if you think that the original version is actually pretty good, you know, mm -hmm. uh, like vocally, you know, then you have to rematch that again, you know, maybe you could get a better sound all in all. But I, I think just think it's you you should leave that stuff alone. I, w I wouldn't do that again. Let me put it yeah. that way. Well, w w what I'm more referring to is, for example, the song with these eyes, right? It sound you did a basically the album, the song sounds different than because mm. the original version's a lot more mellow. This one's a lot heavier. And I thought it was actually really cool that you went and did something like that. You know, you made the song different. It wasn't like you did the exact same thing you did on the record. And that's really kind of more what I'm referring to as, as to why I like that album in particular. Yeah, but that, that's actually that song is uh, is actually probably one of my all time favorite pretty made ballads to be honest. Like, mm -hmm. and that's actually the song I refer to because I remember I had to do the vocals for it. You know, I was like, it was like, yeah, but I mean, well, I mean, with the vocals, the original vocals on that track in particular, I think are great. You know, so I mean, I was really happy with those. So, so to you know to redo that again, it's like uh, trying to pump new life into something that already had its own life. How to explain it? You know, so. Yeah. Well, that's uh, but but you're right it is it is heavier and also the, i think the rest of the stuff is as well and also because it's jacob produced it and, and yes yeah. 
still played with detuned guitars and stuff like that on some of the songs so it it, it sounds more up to date yeah like psycho, so, some, psycho time bomb planet earth definitely in my opinion i like the new version better than the original one okay yeah i, I gotta admit i haven't heard the the album in many many years <laughs> <laughs> no no I, 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 get, I, can't, I can't even remember what songs we got on there but well i can if you say it but uh, i haven't heard it for a long time i just know i'm not uh, well, i wouldn't do it again but uh you, talk, you talked a little bit earlier about um you know playing some festivals and you never really got to do a, a proper tour for your the, the last pretty maids album obviously and now you're going to be playing some shows and, and playing those songs and stuff like that you know we had this whole pandemic thing we had we had you know a lot, i mean musicians are probably the people that were able like the last people to go back to work essentially um so are things a lot different for you now you know, being that after all this stuff has happened, you know, playing these festivals and maybe even booking this tour and, and what has changed for you? Everybody has a different story behind it. Some people, they didn't have bad at an eye, but some folks have had, you know, there's been a, a huge difference. A lot of it is costs and stuff like that as well. Oh, yeah. I definitely have because I just did two gigs in Sweden this weekend, right? The first two gigs and we got another four gigs coming up mm -hmm. and the tour is actually supposed to be longer. I'm talking about my own band here, right? Yeah. Um, the tour is supposed to be uh, include my, uh, several more gigs in Germany, uh, Switzerland, Poland, and stuff like that. But I mean, the logistics were just fucked because of the expenses. I believe, but you've heard that from a lot of bands these days. Mm -hmm. Everybody says the same thing, and it's and it's the truth. The truth is that the um, it's simply not. I mean, the expenses are not proportional to the fees. That that's the way it is. Yeah. So it's uh, and I don't want to take a bank loan to go out on the road. You know, it just makes things very complicated. I would love to do more gigs. Yeah, but um, but also I had it like I said. Also, we do these six gigs and let's see how I feel. You know, and so far on the two first gigs it's been going great because i have some asthmatic uh, bronchitis issues some uh, sequelae to the immune therapy i had you know so i had to deal with that i have to deal with this but it, it's fine right now and uh so we just cut the tour tour basically basically because of, of of the expenses and stuff like that so but i hope i can be able to go to do some more touring in the spring and then we'll do some festivals next year we go to japan in february to do two shows so uh no we're still we're still rolling man we I, I like to keep this on the road as long as possible yeah. absolutely so so when you decided to do these solo records uh you know all three i think all three of them like i said i think they're all three of them are very good um they were very well written and obviously working with jacob i mean they're going to sound good um but when you decided to do these solo records what was the response like because for years you know you're you're in it's always it's always difficult to wonder, okay, how are people going to react to my solo career as opposed to you've known me in this band for like 40 years? And now what was the response like when you started putting these records out? Well, the, the response was uh, overwhelming, to be honestly, because I mean, also because the songs are more personal. Uh, I know a lot of the songs, and in particular, there's some songs of the first album, when I hear them today, I know exactly who I was, uh, where I was in my life at mm -hmm. the time. Because I was in pit, I was in kind of shock and grief because of the, the, the cancer thing. Uh, so, but people could feel that. Uh, but I've been trying to be very positive lyrically, you know, that even, I'm basically trying to send this message out to people that, even though you face the the wall, you know, and everything seems mm -hmm. really uphill, you know, uh, there are basically two paths you can follow. You can sit down, feel sorry for yourself, or you can indulge yourself in something, uh, make some plans for yourself, set some goals. You know, that's that's really what I did. Uh, that's what yeah. the music, once again, kind of has been my savior out of this. You know, so in that way, they they they've been um, it's been different because I've had the ability uh, to be to be more personal lyrically and stuff like that. I, I basically write the, the songs exactly that I wanted to do. And and, uh, and of course, a lot of people say is that, well, it sounds a bit like Pretty Mates. It, but of course, it sounds like Pretty Mates because I am I was the voice in that band always, you know. Yeah. So whatever, you know, I'm telling you what I have. If I decided to do a disco album or I, I decided to do a jazz album, people would still say, oh, that's the voice of Pretty Mates, you know. So it's a blessing and a curse, you know. <laughs> you know. But but as I said, I never had any intention of, of doing anything uh, you know, more modern or whatever, yeah. you know. I just you know good song is good song you know and then um, and i think we we've, we've done really well i'm really happy about all three albums actually they are what they are they got their own life you know so that's pretty cool yeah i would say they're all three of them are different in their own way to, to be honest with you um i think the the third one's probably a little heavier than the, than the previous ones mm, um, but 
I think, yeah, I, I mean, I get where people say it sounds like the Pretty Maids, but, you know, there are some differences in the songs. I mean, the Pretty Maids for the last, you know, 13, 14 years, I mean, you guys have been a much heavier band, you know, sound wise than you had been before. You know, so if I really was going to compare it to you, I'd probably compare it some of the songs to, you know, maybe some of the older records. And even when you go that, that route, I mean, you're talking maybe one or two songs on the on the albums. You're not talking about the entire record, which is a, like a heavy metal record. These are more these songs are more AOR oriented. That was like the biggest thing that I took from it, you know, when I had listened to all three of them. Yeah, but yes, he's probably right. I mean, it, it. I mean, it's just as I said. You know, I'm. I'm not. It's not that I'm sitting down and say planning that now I want to do a heavier album. That's not the way it worked. Actually, it was just mm -hmm. by coincidence. Actually, the most important thing for me is to have ten, eleven, twelve good songs. You know, but that that each song has its yeah. That's, I say it again. It's own life. You know that that yeah. these song tells a different story. You know, that's that's the way it is on all the albums, basically. Sure. So so. That that was my goal. Well, my goal was just to put out some good music, you know, that I liked and we agreed on, and and that's that's what I did, you know. Now I know you just you know you just talked about you know having cancer and actually you know basically beating that whole thing that went on. And I know anytime you go through a pretty bad experience, it doesn't matter what it is. It could be cancer. It could be a a life trauma. You know, what were some of the things that helped you get through that? And if somebody finds out they have something like that you know what advice would you give them well i, I would well, as i just said before i mean you, you when you get a, a cancer i mean i still have a heavy uh, cancer diagnosis I, I can never change that it's stage four cancer because it's spread from the lungs to the bones mm -hmm. so i can't do anything about that that said i mean it is what it is and what you're going to do is if well that's the way i perceive it you know um you 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 can the rest of those two paths you can go you can either give up or you can say no fucking way man i want i still got something to offer and, yeah. and i still have dreams and and you know and meanwhile i had a grandchild and stuff if you asked me four years ago i'd never thought i'd have a grandchild you know mm -hmm. uh, and that's the song sold about is 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 basically a lullaby to her you know so yeah so you know, all the time you get you you got to set new goals now my next goal is is these gigs and and some more touring 2024 maybe new album at some point and that had that has just simply helped me so far i'm, I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. if i hadn't done anything uh i probably would have kind of faded away somehow i i, I don't know how the situation would have been then it's just sure. my own the way i i think it would have gone but i don't know but i'm still here man and i'm i'm, I'm i never in my craziest dreams would have thought that i'd do three albums and no. actually not a union album on top you know and i've been touring with abatasia all summer last year and been to south america with them this year and stuff like that so yeah i've had enough to do basically the the song the song make it count i if i had to pick a song from the three albums you've put out that's probably my favorite one I don't know, there's something like when, when I first heard that the, it's the last song in the second album um, to me, I, that song really moved me to be honest. I think that's probably in my opinion, one of the best songs you've ever written. And it really had a great message in it. When, when I hear, when I hear that song, in fact, I went and listened to that yesterday that listen to that whole album yesterday. And that song really moved me quite a bit. And you know, what was this, the meaning behind it? Well, the meaning behind the album was, was as, as I just just said in the yeah. previous uh, answer, that, that that to to just be happy for being here. I mean, I, I, I could only write that song. I mean, the song in itself, the structure, the melody, the, the chorus is a little melancholic, right? Um, but um, but the message is basically that we should learn how to appreciate every day we wake up, you know, and yep. uh, and, and make everything count. Basically, it's as simple as that, you know. And that's also what it says in the lyrics, you know. And that's something. That's a conclusion, you know. You come to when you when you had a meeting with a with the grim reaper you know you you saw his uh halo somewhere out there you know sure um it's just to it's just trying to to give this positive message that um uh, there's always uh something you can do i mean you you cannot change your you you cannot change well in my case i can't change my my diagnosis but i can get mm -hmm. the best out of life you know oh absolutely and that's yeah. the message that's what i'm trying to do and and you know moving on to to another different topic um avantasia i thought the addition of you you know tobias samet bringing you into avantasia i thought what was awesome and you know i i, I like those i like actually pretty much everything that he's ever done for the most part uh talk about getting involved with avantasia and what that's been like for you 
Yeah, but I mean, um, it's, it's funny because, I mean, uh, Toby actually called me back in 1990. Uh, and I remember the con- conversations to this day. Uh, that I, was, I don't think, I, I can't remember if I had it. I probably had a, a, a mobile phone, but he, he called me on the landline. I don't know. I never found out where he got the number from. But anyway, so he called me and said, Hi, I'm Tobias Summers from Ed Guy, and uh, um, I'm doing this uh, rock opera project and stuff. And I would like to have some of the people that, that, were, that I was inspired by on this. Uh, Michael Kiska was one of them because he grew up with Halloween and he grew up with Pretty Maze. He grew up with Magnum and all those. So all these singers actually ended, turned, you know, ended up on the invitation. That's why. So, uh, so I just said at the time that, oh, yeah, I never, I didn't know that guy. You know, and I, I didn't know about him, to be honest. And I just said, well, yeah, well, thank you very much, man. It's very nice of you asking, but I, I got a pass, you know, because I'm, I'm not doing anything outside of Pretty Mates. Uh, and, and that's the way it was back then. And so, as it happens, in, I think in 2012, you know, we were playing this uh, 70 tons of metal cruise. Mm hmm. In the Caribbeans and a mutual friend of ours introduced uh, us both to each other and, and you know we just said hey do you remember me I called you back and I said yeah as a matter of fact I do and um, and then since that I'm a grew pretty big you know and, and and then he asked me again if I wanted to sing a, uh, on an album and I said yeah man I mean I'll be here what it is you know send me a mp3 file of the track uh, you want me to sing on I'll take a listen and that was Invoke the Machine from the Mystery of Time album mm-hmm. I thought it was a cool song and uh, I said yeah I'll do that I'll do that you know so I did it and then as it happened I was asked to do the tour as well which I could actually do some parts of I couldn't do South America so I did some festivals with pretty mates and since that, we just became very good friends. And I, I really enjoyed a lot being an imitation because it's been great for me to do something else, you know, to, to see how it works. I mean, it's it's Toby's project, you know, but um, then there's all these different guests, singers and stuff, but we can all shine, you know. It's uh, And it's a great chemistry within the band, the crew, the management, you know. I love them all. So it was a very easygoing project. Yeah, the other thing that's cool about it is you get to sing on stage with a lot of different singers you know, a lot, a lot of other singers. And, you know, I don't think you'd really done a lot of that. And what was that experience like when you first, like you're on stage with Michael Kiske and, you know, some of these other uh, people that he's had sing, you know, in Avantasia over the years. And what was that experience like when it first happened? Well, it was funny. I mean, I knew Michael Kiske from the old days, but I hadn't seen him in, in 20 years or something like that or more, actually. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, well, it was, it was good fun working with those guys because uh, it's not really a competition. Singing is not a competition. What is? We're all individual, very different singers, you know. I mean, I'm not a, um, I mean, Michael Kiske got this high octave, you know, uh, a voice, uh, power metal singer, real power metal singer. Uh, I don't know what I am, you know, I'm probably just a pop singer in a band or Eric Martin. And we had Jeff Tate, John Lana, they're all great singers in their own right, you know. So, so, but, and I think that's what, what's great, Bob Catley, that the, what's great is we all bring these different identities into the music. And, and sure. Toby's got to have, he's, he's fantastic and finding the right songs or writing the right songs for him, particularly that and that singer, you know. So, uh, so I think the, 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 the songs that he gave to me that he wanted me to sing on fits perfectly in, in my range and, and everything and i think every every singer agrees on that you know more or less yeah i just think it would be a lot of i don't i really wouldn't see it as a competition but i would think it would be a lot of fun you just go on you're singing with people with different voices and everything absolutely it has been a lot of fun i mean i have i've got some really great friendships in this and i'm with eric martin is probably we joined at the same time so we're very good friends and also write each other and stuff like that and it's been fun man we having so much fun we're, we're behind the stage you know having a, a sip of wine and stuff like that okay it's your turn now oh, all right, all right. See, you, see you in five minutes you know <laughs> we had a lot of fun it's been really cool it's really cool doing it you know when i go back and i listen to an album like red hot and heavy and future world listen to those records you know obviously the music scene was a lot different you know back in those days and it seems like you know in the 90s you know probably the early part of the 2000s this kind of music really wasn't you know it it, it wasn't as big in my opinion as it is now and, and what do you think changed you know within the scene because it, you know a lot of bands just started writing better songs i mean that's one of the things that I've, I've noticed but you know for you what has changed you know what what's it like for you now compared to say back in those days well, I, you know, you you mature as a musician, as a, as a songwriter, as a person, basically, you know. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a little, to be honest, it's a little depressed because, uh, 
um, because I, I was there in the good days, you know. I mean, we, we got some really bad record deals, you know, but I came into the business when you actually sold a lot of vinyls and you sold a lot yeah. of seeds. And I've just seen how everything's been been falling apart for for the, in particular the last twenty years. With first with CD copying and then the Napster thing, the downloading thing. And today it's all streaming. And the, the, the and you probably heard the story before, but the musicians doesn't really get paid much from all the streaming, you know. And you don't sell yeah. a lot of physical records anymore. So um, I think it's for for all the younger band and new generation of bands. I, I, I as a matter of fact, I know that they get paid very little to do albums. You know, if it wasn't for the fact they could sit back home in their on their rooms with <laughs> with a Logic or Pro Tools, I mean, it wouldn't be possible to do an album. So I just think all the money is out of the business. And now you've got to go out on the road, you know, and sell some merchandise and stuff to make to, to make a living of it. I mean, unfortunately, I got a lot of a big back catalog of songs that I still get that paid. Oh sure, yeah, but, uh, but yeah. It's, I mean, financially, I think the music business sucks. To be honest, it's it's not. And these days, now people, you know, the promoters want to share the merchandise somewhere and in certain places and stuff like that. It just sucks. So, yeah. Um, yeah, the, the, the whole enticement in, in, in to do this and you know, enticement, whatever it's called, uh, just get it's not as good as it was, it was back then. You really got to love doing it, otherwise, you it. I think it's pretty hard. But uh, we, we we do it for the love of rock and roll, and so do I. Yeah, absolutely. It, it's kind of like, it, it seems like it's a little easier to get some exposure because you have the digital age. But then again, there's more bands out there, more people putting stuff out. But I, I get what you're saying. You know, streaming is like, I believe when I looked a few months ago, it's like 84% of the income generated in the music business. And it doesn't pay a whole lot, which is sort of depressing. Then you have merch cuts you know, from, from a lot of venues, like for example, you know, I just did something on the podcast where we talked about, you know, they take a merch cut, they take it from the, the actual price of the shirt, not the profit from the shirt. And there was a band that actually sold so much merchandise. It, it, they actually owed the venue money. And sure. because of this, and it ended, ended up going into a little bit of the guarantee that they were getting from, I mean, they still made money in the gig, but they made less because they sold too much merchandise, which is insane. It's insane. That's totally insane. That's what I'm saying. I mean, it's it's yeah. it's, it's, a little, it's a little crazy. So in that way, I think it's a little. Um, it just goes. It's going downhill. I mean, basically financially, I think for for the mm -hmm. business. I mean, unless you're Guns and Roses or Def Leppard or Motley Crue, whoever you are, you know. But uh, you can but play. for all the blues bands, it's 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 tough times. I'd say you know, and I and I know uh, you know for a fact that I've been touring with. Uh, with people like um you know some of the guys from Avantasia, herbie the one of the back-end vocalists and yeah. adrian, adrian cowan and they're touring like uh three or four bands on the bill you know and, and band three bands on the tour bus and stuff like that's the only way to make it happen and then sell some merchandise you know but they haven't been they weren't there in the good times you know so it's probably easier for them to consume doing that you know but uh but when you when you've been there for 40 years you've just seen how it slowly took a wrong turn you know yeah, yeah. well herbie sings in firewind and uh yeah, very good band i mean you know it, it's it's crazy that a lot of these people a lot of these guys they sing in like multiple bands and then you know you're not touring in buses you're touring in vans at, at this point because the buses are like three times more expensive they than are. than they literally used to be they are literally they are a nightliner was is, is here in europe it's like three times as, as it was in 2018 you know beginning of 19. yeah yeah, some some crazy stuff. Well, we're gonna end this off here, and and I have a couple more questions for you. Um, if you don't do an album with Pretty Maids, you may be planning on doing another solo album, you know, down the road. Yeah, but I mean, uh, before we we did this Pretty Maids thing, uh, or decided on it, I already had written some songs for my own stuff, you know, but okay. uh, partly recorded some of it, but. I have no, uh, Paul, I have no uh, deadline right now to do anything new, actually. Uh, but I got a lot of song ideas, a lot of actual and finished songs too, you know. So let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. As I said, I'd like to, you know, to to to, to take this on the road next year as much as possible. You know? But uh, of course, I might record something in between. That's not unlikely. No, that's great, man. Well, hey, any, um, you, you know, <laughs> here's another interesting thing. You worked with a lot of musicians in Avantasia, and you've obviously done some guest stuff over the years if there is are there any musicians out is there one musician out there that you wish you could possibly work with that you've never worked with before you yeah pick somebody yeah paul mccartney <laughs> <laughs> no i don't i don't have any 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 specific in mind to be honest uh no i mean of course there might be some 
interesting project at some point you know that that comes yeah. up. I don't know, but I, I have no plans i mean there, there's there's a lot of great musicians a lot of great singers and songwriters and stuff like that you know but uh i actually feel good with the setup i have now and working with these people i work with uh, and writing my own material you know? right uh, well hey man they just put the last Beatles song out so yeah i heard you know. it man i heard it first time i heard it i, I couldn't uh i said what is that why all this fuss about this song i mean it's just uh and then i saw it with the video then i suddenly i thought the song was a lot better and i saw listen to it this morning i was in the gym you know i said well it's not a bad song but it's but it's i mean it's it's be it's beatles it's the beatles my all-time favorite band so i yeah. mean We'll find a lot of better Beatles songs, but it's the, probably likely the final Beatles song at all. You know, so, and it's yeah, I, I felt like I took a trip back in time because you had a new Beatles song and a Rolling Stones album came out like literally around the same time. It's like, man, are we back in like the sixties or? Yeah, but it's. <laughs> I mean, in particular, I mean, the Stones thing. I just I listened to it, and you know, I think I think it's great. I mean, I like the Stones too, and particularly all the uh, yeah, the late sixties and early seventies period. Yeah. You know. Uh, Exile on Main Street and stuff like that. Uh, I think it's it's pretty close. Actually, pretty close to start me up in that kind of songs. You know, yeah, it, it's great. And listen, to, I mean, look at Mick Jagger. I mean, listen to him. He's still dancing. He was fucking twenty years old, and <laughs> his voice is still there. You know, it's it's incredible. I think it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Give that hope, man. There's hope. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there is hope. There is actual hope. Well, hey, you know, um, any last words to say to your fans out there that are going to be checking this interview out uh, on the podcast? Yeah, I mean, uh, well, I hope that uh, you enjoy the new album Trinity as well as the first two ones, uh, and I and I really hope you dig it, and I hope that I'll be able to to tour in America. I know it's very difficult, it's very expensive, and stuff like that, but I hope uh, maybe a proc power or something at some point, you know. Uh, Mm -hmm. able to take this band to america at some point i really hope i would love to i would love to Absolutely. well I'll, I'll end it with this um these are the music you've written on these last three albums is some of the best stuff i've ever heard you write in, in all seriousness um from the very first song um on the first solo album you put out uh i was like i was you know that song right away drew me into that album right i mean it it really did and um i think i think that you're on a, a great role with these solo records I, I really think that these are all three of these are great and uh there's a lot of very moving you know i think with me the lyrics hit home probably more more so than maybe some of the other stuff you did with the pretty maids that's kind of how like the lyrical content for me it's funny i was reviewing i actually reviewed this i actually haven't put the podcast up but i i mentioned the lyrical content if i had to give it a rating out of 10 it'd be like an 11 right i mean that's that's what i think anyway and that's aside from the songs and the lyric the lyrics really hit home with me in a lot of these tracks well i feel i'm i, I basically agree with but thank you very much uh but i agree with you i think it's, it's three really good albums i'm really happy about it that i that i've done these three albums and, and as i said yeah lyrically i mean there's a message there for people you know uh, mm -hmm. uh and i'm and i'm happy people picking up on it you know because um um lyrically of course i had the chance to do something more personal here because it's not a band thing you know it, it was pretty sure. nice i rep represent the band kind of yeah. you know so these songs is very heart and soul and it comes from the heart much of this you know so but thank you <laughs>